I'll probably be here for a long time. Bubba. I don't get paid, but I do. I still get the, you know, the housing. I pay fees like everybody else. I just, several years ago, I dedicated my life to God and to the ministry. It's saving my life. I was a druggie on the street, so I lost everything. I'm on disability, so that's my pay. I also needed a structured environment in my life. I, you know, I'm scared to death to actually go out and try it on my own. I can't afford it on disability. I don't get more than 844 bucks a month. That's not much money. I have a truck. I pay my insurance. I'll probably be here for a long time. So there's three reasons I'm excited to talk to you today about this work. The first is that I get to collaborate on this piece with two fantastic undergraduates at the University of Delaware, one of whom you see here, Maggie Buckridge. Along with Michaela Erdoisa, we got to work with our interview transcripts to pull out I poems. The second reason I'm happy to talk with you today. I poems take the first I sentences from interview transcripts and put them together into a more accessible, pithy, and often quite provocative encapsulation of the interviews. I poems are a feminist research method that allow us to tell you more than you would get typically in the qualitative research article. And finally, I'm really happy to have the chance to bring to you today the voices of people who we don't often think about when we think about housing policy or other issues in this area. In the United States, people who are convicted of sex offenses are placed on a public registry, which restricts a great deal of the things they can do in terms of living, going to school, working, and participating in daily life. In many states in the US, people who are convicted of street-based sex work or other criminalized sex work are also listed on the sex offender registry. It's important to listen to the experiences of people who are trying to leave prison and make good under these barriers, including people like Bubba, who talk about living on a bare minimum and feeling incredibly grateful for a housing program that gives them that kind of opportunity. But people like Bubba are really vulnerable to the goodwill of the people who run these organizations. In the US, religiously run organizations like this one are subject to much less oversight and therefore create more opportunity for potential coercion and manipulation. Now in our research, as we've talked to people who run these facilities, as well as those who live and work within them, we have not seen examples of overt coercion. But it is important to pay attention to the possibilities for coercion and manipulation and to recognize the incredible constraints that people are living under. Thank you for listening.